Most of our uh, listeners will know that last year in the SGO, there were two abstracts presented uh, comparing the minimally invasive to open surgery. And uh, it was a shock to everyone when we saw that the minimally invasive arms in these both studies were underperforming compared to uh, the open arms. Um, I was the discussant for these two um, uh, abstracts when they were uh, presented as late-breaking abstracts. Um, and right after that meeting, uh, we had this intense desire to make sure that you know we look back at our own results and see if uh, you know are we performing at the same level as presented in this study, or are our results very different? So um, during my discussion, I put out a slide asking for institutions to reach out to me if uh, they wanted to collaborate, and uh, you know the response was great. Um, we ended up uh, eventually uh, getting 10 institutions participating in this study. I presented the data for eight. Two institutions we're still waiting on data use agreement, uh, but overall these were all high volume institutes, um, and uh, we were able to get together about 780 cases, um, out of which after excluding some patients, we had 731 patients who were eligible for the study, and about one third of them underwent open surgery and the other underwent minimally invasive. Majority 90% were under uh, robotics, uh, which was one of the criticism of LACC trial because majority of the patients in that were laparoscopic. Um, and uh, I have to confess that when I started all this, I was in the camp where I thought that our data will refute the LACC trial results. Uh, but uh, you know, data is data. When we analyzed it, uh, we saw the same signal that minimally invasive surgery had a higher recurrence rate. Most people were not as shocked with these results as they were last year during the SGO meeting. Um, you know, most people uh, had seen the abstract before. Uh, what has been consistent is that since the LACC trial, uh, there, there's been one publication from Korea, another one from University of Alabama, and now this abstract. They're all pointing in one direction. There's also a abstract put out by the British government where they've looked at their uh, seer type database in, in England, and they found the same thing. Um, so I think people were very primed in knowing. What our study added was that we looked at some of the specifics which other studies did not have, like what happens in tumors less than two centimeters, what is the role of uterine manipulator. Um, I think I am not able to answer the uterine manipulator question completely, but we were able to, be able to answer that the type of uterine manipulator doesn't matter because there were some folks who were thinking that uh, EEA sizer or a culpo probe which doesn't go inside the uterus, maybe something you can use safely, but our data doesn't show that. The recurrence rates are about the same. Now, we didn't have enough patients in minimally invasive arm who did not have a uterine manipulator, so I cannot answer the question whether if we don't do that, if it's safe or not. Um, we did specifically look at the question of two centimeters, which was a lingering question after the NCDB study and the LACC study. Also, the Korean data pointed that maybe less than two centimeters tumor cutoff, it's okay to do minimally invasive. Uh, but unfortunately in our data, what, um, that didn't pan out. Um, one of the question which has lingered on is two centimeter based on what? Uh, there's a surgeon's determination before the surgery of two centimeter, and then there's pathologic determination of two centimeters. So we collected both of those, and we found that in one fourth of the cases, the surgeons thought the tumor is less than two centimeter, but the final pathology showed the tumor was actually more than two centimeters. So that gives you a little pause that in one fourth uh, of the cases, you're going to be wrong when you make this kind of estimation of tumor size. Um, so these are the things which our study added to the literature and the ongoing debate. Um, I think uh, my personal view is that at this point of time, as we continue to go through the data, which is coming from multiple different institutions, uh, that we put a hold on doing MIS radical hysterectomies. Um, and I know that there's a lot of interest in uh, repeating a randomized control trial. Um, I think it has to be carefully thought out. Um, and uh, there still might be a role for minimally invasive, but right now the data is all pointing in the opposite direction. Yeah, I think one of the points I uh, would like to add is that I'm not sure if this debate is worth having. Um, and I showed a slide during the presentation that uh, we published a paper in uh, Gynecologic Oncology Journal last year 
looking at the national inpatient sample where we've seen a consistent drop in radical hysterectomy cases. Uh, most surgeons are now doing fewer than six to eight cases a year. Um, in some institutions, it's six to eight a year for the entire institute. So um, I, I'm not sure how we're going to get enough numbers to do another trial. And if it's only a small population which is affected and there's strong level one data in favor of open surgery, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is where I would put most of my resources. Um, you know, if I had the choice to make allocation of resources, I would put them on HPV vaccination uptake uh, and prevent the cancer altogether rather than have to deal with how to manage it.